Well, we have a rather intriguing subject this morning, the problem of memory. And I think too many of us take the whole field of uh, mental continuities for granted, whereas in reality they are quite mysterious in their own right. Memory is something that we all need and we all abuse. Memory is something that helps us uh, to build a philosophy of life, and it also can help us to tear one down very quickly. It can strengthen religion or destroy it. It can lead to happiness or misery. And in many cases, it contributes to life and hastens death. So altogether, we have to give this whole field a little spe special consideration, especially if we hope uh, to unfold and develop the internal potentials of our own natures. To begin with, then, we have to try to understand that memory is a subject in great need of discipline. We must discipline the things we remember, and we must remember the things that we discipline. Now, memory discipline is something that is disappearing rapidly from our way of life. Today, everyone is pushing thoughts and responsibilities to one side. We are trying to avoid the monotonies and the routines and the skills which strengthen our memory power. Probably the most important thing that we gain from schooling is to strengthen and discipline memory. Most of what we may learn can perhaps be forgotten with benefit to all concerned. But the power to learn, the ability to maintain a continuity of recollections, the power to be able to answer the questions that are asked or to spell the words at the spelling test, these are disciplines of the mind. The multiplication table is a discipline. Practically all of the social graces are disciplines. And where these disciplines are not severe enough, the graces become disgraces. Every person must learn uh, to control and direct his own thoughts and have develop a consistent continuity of mental activity. He must be able to strengthen faculties which will serve him throughout his entire span of life. And today, we are subject to many interruptions, inconsistencies of thought, and a great many persons are deliberately trying to ignore experience. They want to avoid and evade the problem, problem of facing themselves. As a result of this, and other factors involved, confusion, stress, inconsistencies, the memory faculty is corrupted, it is damaged, and we lose the power to think from A to B and from B to C. So in childhood, we should be disciplined. And very often today, parents have not disciplined themselves. We inherit mental infirmities as a birthright. And the undisciplined mind, like an uncontrolled body, can be a cause of a great many problems. The disciplines we are seeking for are not only for the mind's sake, but give the mind the power to control and correct the mistakes of the emotions and the body. Without discipline, we cannot control ourselves. And we also have to have a background of experience to find out how to control ourselves and what we should allow and what we should not allow to come into our personal lives. In addition to the weakness of memory, we now find that there is a tendency to corrupt what memory we do have. Uh, today we are able to imagine many, many conditions, and then bestow upon these imaginations 
the strength of a memory factor. Many people today are remembering things that never happened to them. They are also remembering how things that did happen were so distorted or misunderstood as to lose the power to contribute to knowledge. Memory is here to help us to learn. Memory is part of universal schooling. But in many instances, we use it as a method or means of evasion to get out of a situation. We use it to impress other people with our importance. We use it also to shift blame from ourselves to someone else. We use it for all kinds of evasions and compromises of attitudes. The only reason this is possible is because we have never disciplined it correctly. The mind is almost like another person in our body. This other person can be a perpetual adolescent and also a juvenile delinquent. And the worst part of the mental delinquent is it may be juvenile and be 70 years old. <laughs> All the way along, we know that we are here to learn. We are here to grow. We are here to improve ourselves and to serve each other in useful capacities and a bad memory frustrates nearly all of these purposes. The memory is essential to the preservation of any type of constructive program. Of course, it is also true that memory now is supported by the written word. A memory is supported by the, the press, by the media, and by all types of Subset, uh, subsidiary helps but most of these helps are themselves corrupted we cannot depend upon what we read we cannot depend upon news reports we cannot accept the opinions of other people and deprived of all of these crutches we have to depend upon ourselves only to discover that we do not even have the power to make an opinion that means anything so the problem always is that the mind has to serve as a kind of guardian, a protector of integrities. And to do this, it is necessary for, have, for us to have a full development of mental discipline. Now this discipline must begin, as we have suggested, in childhood. It is up to our parents to see that we learn to obey. This is difficult because the parent hasn't obeyed in his generation and is becoming less and less interested in forcing unpleasant attitudes upon his children. The children, therefore, find that it is very easy to avoid or evade family discipline. And if it looks as though it might be a little difficult, the child may even leave home anything to escape the assuming of responsibility. And yet maturity without assuming responsibility is impossible. Today we have a mass of delinquent people who would be, who would be on the way to correct careers if they hadn't built a barrier against learning, a barrier against ex experimenting and experiencing the constructive results of growth. After all, if we are believing in a divine plan, we believe that the human being is here to grow, to unfold his spiritual potentials, to become a little better every day. And this process, according to many systems, continues incarnation after incarnation, always for the purpose of becoming better, always for the purpose of drawing upon internal resource with greater advantage to our own lives. Now, undisciplined internal resource is no longer an asset. Undisciplined, the mind can lead us into every trap that there is. It can force us to all types of mistakes. It can bring us down to misery because of the, we accept flattery. It also makes it almost impossible for us to accept good advice. Now, good advice is something nearly everyone is afraid of today. 
Also, we have to wonder whether the person giving the advice is really qualified to do so. Therefore, in problems of accepting the advice of others, we must also depend to a certain degree upon our own internal resources. Someone may come to us and say we are drinking too much. One may, of course, to answer that is to say it's none of their business. But this does no good and just simply helps us to perpetuate a bad habit. Perhaps we do not believe that we are drinking too much. We do not know just exactly how to accept or reject the advice of a well-intentioned person. The only answer is to dig into our own experience. With a little sober thinking, it is possible for us to find out in ourselves what we are actually doing in the consumption of alcohol. We can find out by the use of memory what it has done to us in the past. If we find by reviewing our own case that we have suffered in the past, then the advice of a good friend should be given special consideration. And as one of the old Hindu sacred books points out, one of the ways that God speaks to mankind is by putting the words in the mouth of a good friend. So it's always wise to be observant. We also can realize that we may be blamed unjustly for things that we are not guilty of having performed. Here again only, our own memory can tell us what we did on all these different occasions, how we reacted to circumstances. Thus it becomes possible to be a criterion over advice. We use this type of uh, judgment on certain occasions. If we go to the doctor's office and the doctor recommends a remedy, we take it and it makes us worse. We have a certain recollection of this experience and are apt to remind the doctor of the situation. On the other hand, there are happenings every day in which things are going badly and we ignore the evidence completely. Now also memory has a certain censorship factor. How much of the things we remember are worth remembering? How much do we really need this storehouse of uh, software in our own skulls? How much do we actually depend upon memory to strengthen character or allow it to weaken character? Most minds today are cluttered. They are completely a mass of conflicting uh, concepts and opinions, many of which are no, are no value whether they are true or not. It is necessary to try to find out how to clear the mind for the essential judgments of living. One of these problems, of course, one of the worst of these to face, is the problem of religion. Religion brings to the mind of the individual a variety of dogmas, teachings, creeds. The religious world is made up of systems of thought, backed by sages or saints or mystics, or in, unfortunately in our day by a number of very shrewd businessmen. But actually, we may spend a lifetime studying a creed, only to find out before we come to the end of life that the creed was not correct in the first place. We were over-influenced by someone else's attitudes or opinions or we were sold a deal because we did not think things through for ourselves. In this way, we can learn and memorize and quote vast amounts of information or misinformation that has little or no lasting value. We also find by studying the media and other methods of communication uh, that we are loaded with opinions, prejudices, and conceits, we are exploited mentally and emotionally and physically all the time. We, have, we feel very sad about this sometimes, but it never seems to occur to most people to allow their own mind to be the leader and discipline the mind until it can lead properly. 
the individual reaching majority is supposed to be in a condition of the mind which will enable him to think straight and control and direct his own life correctly. He is supposed to be mature. By maturity it does not mean that he is physically adult. By maturity it means that he is in a condition of compound nature which enables him to lead himself correctly through the, the future years of his life. If maturity does not bring with it judgment, the educational system has failed, the home has failed, uh, the experiences of his friends have been ignored, and the individual is continuing to be a perpetual adolescent, and as such suffers continuously from his own mental weaknesses, but is not inclined to correct them. He finds other excuses, or evades them, or simply ignores the mistakes and their consequences. This builds up until it can produce practically every tragedy that we know in life. Nearly every disaster that happens to the individual has a major factor of lack of insight, lack of judgment, lack of common sense somewhere built into it. Now as the individual goes along through the years, he accumulates a vast baggage of mental uh, ideas, concepts, and baggage. He will constantly find that he is being influenced by his own thinking patterns. And these thinking patterns are very often not only inconsistent, but actually contradictory. We have a tendency in learning today to accept various points of view without question, even though they are irreconcilable. If you read three books on modern science, you may find statements in them that are hopelessly inconsistent. They will represent perhaps a very sincere and careful judgment by a person whose judgment was not sufficiently strong to prevent him from making mental error. Therefore, most books are really a story of ill-digested opinions. They are the individual reading somebody else's attitudes, and because these attitudes appear in print, they seem very important, very significant, and if well-worded, can have a very captivating appeal. But when it's all said and done, there's no fact there. Now, to find facts for the average person, probably the Baconian point of view is as good as any. A fact is something that can stand the great tests that uh, experience is subjected to. A fact must be reasonable. It must be a way that has been proven in the past. All facts, basically, are moral issues. And the moralities of those who live the best must be the guiding uh, information. Also, there must be the factor that the belief or the attitude or the opinion is not contrary to the experienced good of mankind. Also, in this respect, we have great codes of laws to assist us in developing the integrities of life. These laws are built upon the experience of humanity over thousands of years. We often conceal these laws under the name of a single prophet or some great spiritual teacher, but they are actually an accumulation of man's experience. They are the evidences that have been gathered from lives and living over periods of centuries. Therefore, these things should be taken with some seriousness, and we should be very hesitant to violate a rule that has proved useful and correct for 5,000 years. And the fact that we are living now does not mean that we can break the integrities of the past. It should be that we would be stronger in keeping them. 
and perhaps adapt them a little more to our own current needs. But when the great teachings say, Thou shalt not kill, that is exactly what they mean. And for thousands of years we have broken this rule. We have justified it by every conceivable excuse. We have called it patriotism. We have called it inevitable. We have regarded it as a useful discipline. We have also thought of it as curbing uh, the rapidity of population growths. But actually, the simple statement is the fact. And regardless of how we try to avoid and evade, the only thing that death that, that we can gain by destroying life is finally to destroy ourselves. So all the way along, we have this type of thing. Thou shalt not covet. These words have great meaning. In a world, that millions of people accepting a religion with this statement in it and ignoring it completely. Why do they ignore it? simply because their own internal integration has not recorded in the mind the validity of this statement. We have gone through all kinds of experiences of coveting, and our friends have, and our relatives have, and our world has, and we have seen the distress and misery. But when we decide to covet, we do. Now, this means that the discipline of the mind is not strong enough to protect us from the weaknesses of our own attitudes. So we discover that the mind has two distinct processes. One is to defend the right, and the other is to tear it down. Wherever a rule is uncomfortable, our first thought is to get rid of it. As a result of getting rid of it, we get into trouble because practically every important rule of life has to be obeyed. And man was created and not only to dream and to hope and to think, but also to obey the great laws of the universe in which he lives. Now, memory is extremely important in helping us to understand laws that we cannot penetrate metaphysically. We cannot find out how and why God says that we should love one another. We know this has descended to us as an axiom out of the past. We have internally and innately recognized it as highly desirable. We find it in the words of the teachers we revere. To the Christian it is in the words of Christ. To the Buddhist in the words of Buddha. And strangely as it may seem, love is one of the primary words of Muhammad. But with all this, why do we ignore it, compromise it, or misapply it? Because we cannot support the point of view with mental assurance. We have not the ability to quietly tune in upon the meaning of this word as we have experienced it ourselves. We are unable to divide the words from the deeds most closely associated with them. That's the reason why we have to say that the mind exercises center censorship, that it gives us the background, the justification. It provides us with the thoughts and the research necessary to prove that integrity is right and that compromise is a desperate mistake. Now, if that's true, we go along and we finally clutter the mind up thoroughly with everything you can think of. We clutter, clutter it with our opinions and our thoughts and our habits. We clutter it with all our uh, various avocational interests. We spend a whole lifetime trying to be good bankers or good lawyers and load the mind with these problems. We come home to sick children and uh, load the mind with their problems. We also have troubles with our friends and take those on. And we watch the newspaper and try to take on the difficulties of humanity. By the time we reach middle life, we have a badly overworked mental structure. 
We are no longer in the position to control our own minds. We create all kinds of strange chemistries and interrelationships which we are not even constantly aware of. We do not know that we are thinking these thoughts. And if we do know they're coming through, we do not know where they come from or why. And so, uh, by the time we reach 40 or 45 years of, old, of age, we are beginning to have poor judgment. A judgment in which we cannot get a clear answer when we ask ourselves a question. The answer comes through with all kinds of ifs, buts, and ands. Or perhaps we get so weary trying to find the answer we give up anyway. The mind can become a, a haunted house. It is full like an attic of antiques, things of some of which are very valuable and some are not very valuable. Not long ago, a family that I know did a little attic cleaning, and they finally found something that looked as though it might be worth a dollar or two, so they took it to a dealer, and the dealer gave them ten dollars for it. He then turned around and sold it to someone else for five hundred. The uh, individual didn't know the value of what he had. Other people do not know the value of what they think. Others still don't realize that the skills that they have accumulated over a lifetime have value. And because of the lack of discipline, they do not know how to call upon the resources of their own minds. Because of this type of thing, a great many individuals who have had a rich life, as far as experience is concerned, are still subject to all the ills that flesh is heir to. They do not learn the lesson. Now as we grow older, we find that this mind becomes tired. It is weary of the mistakes that it is making, but does not seem to get around to finding out why it makes these mistakes. It follows the general point of view that if I think this way, this is the way it is. And we feel that freedom and liberty and emancipation mean that our own thoughts are just as good as anyone else's and if probabilities a little better. And we also feel that while we may not want to accept the thoughts of others, there is every reason why they should accept our thoughts. All this leads usually to a rather lonely old age because people just do not react the way we think they should. And the reason we think they should is because we don't think at all anyway. We just want them to and assume our own infallibility, although our minds have never been able to demonstrate it in any sense of the word. So by the time we go along, we begin to be what some have called disillusioned. Uh, we, are, we are tired of what we consider to be a life well lived which nobody cares about or respects. A disillusionment means that we have gradually lost our illusions. An illusion being itself unreal, if it is lost, if we are disillusioned, well, all we have lost is something that didn't exist in the first place. Disillusionment does not mean that we are tired or disappointed in truth. It means that we are tired or disappointed in the misinterpretations we have put upon various beliefs and opinions. But as we go along, we notice something happens. And that is that the mind getting fatigued and also suffering from a kind of intellectual indigestion resulting in the way it has been nourished or misnourished begins to drop out things. The mind isn't uh, storing up things as rapidly as it used to because every attic is full. It is not learning more because it has not been able to digest what it has learned. And gradually we notice a process coming over the mind's own functions. And that is that the memory continuities break down. And uh, gradually we begin to forget. And this forgetting generally begins by forgetting unimportant things. The uh, mind begins to censor itself as much as it can in its debilitated state. It says to itself, I know that uh, somebody phoned yesterday 
but it wasn't important, so I can just forget that. And when someone says, did you get a phone call yesterday, we honestly say no, because we have forgotten. Or we put something in between the leaves of a book, something we think is treasure, and then we forget what book we left it in. Or we go out and buy something and do not know what happened to the change. We also are late in paying our bills and get penalties. Little by little, a mind which has never been trained begins to become a delinquent. It has the same t responsibility reflexes as the adolescent who is not interested in doing anything that he's told to do. So these small things of life disappear. It's interesting to find out in working with people that where these small things fall out, they generally things occurring in the middle years first. They fall out of the period, say, between about 20 and 50. In between 20 and 50, uh, a great many details begin to fall out. We can remember uh, that we made a trip, but we just can't remember where we went. And most of all, we can't remember the date. Well, we meet somebody we haven't seen for a long time. We know them. We've seen them. We remember them. We can't remember their names. The name has slipped. Now, at one time, that name could have been remembered instantly. But gradually, the power of all these details is lost because of the confusion that we have allowed to take over. We have never made a serious effort to remember. We have depended upon memory to serve us. But we have never nourished it, trained it, or done anything to make it useful. We just assume that the Lord intended us to have it, that it's something we didn't pay for in the first place, and which we can have for nothing for the rest of our lives. It is not that way in actual living. So little by little, a great many things fall out. This causes a measure of embarrassment. Here we have a Wednesday, which we can remember, and a Friday that we can remember, but what happened on Thursday? We cannot remember. Now we assume, therefore, that it has something to do with Wednesday and will in some way be manifested through Friday. <laughs> that whole in-between, we just do not know what happened. But we then begin to figure that if we tell people that, they'll think we're gradually losing our minds. And what they don't realize is that we've already lost them. <laughs> so where facts begin to fail, imagination comes in. If on Friday we are better off than we were on Wednesday, we conclude that we made a magnificent decision of our own. If we're worse off on Friday, we decide that someone else has treated us badly. Anything that went well was due to our own merits. Anything that did not go well was due to somebody else's ulterior motives, or stupidity, or their forgetfulness. So gradually we build up a double world in which we live, a world of ourselves in which we usually write, a world in contact with other people, in which they are usually wrong. This means that little by little we begin to invent things. The uh, teenager, well, I went, we had one in to see me not long ago, a teenager who was having a great deal of trouble in school uh, talked about the miseries and, and disappointments and hardships of this uh, living away from home and how terrible the faculty treated him. Well, it would have it, it brought, it brought tears to the eyes of a bronze monkey. <laughs> but, before it was over, in, an, in a moment of weakness, he pointed out how he had treated the faculty. That he had been a nuisance from the beginning, that he was never ready with his lessons, that he escaped everything that he could, that he cribbed whenever he could, and was also on probation for the use of marijuana. Now, these things, however, in no way excuse the faculty for not liking him. He was likable to himself, and they should have agreed with him. But little by little, as we go through life, we find out 
that people who bring forward sad stories from the past very often fail to present both sides of the story. They know what other people did to them, but they do not know what they did to other people, and have tried in every possible way to forget it. Now, you can't always forget just because you want to, but you can push something to one side that is a fact, and particularly when reporting the occasion, you can carefully omit the part that is to your own disadvantage. This is a common experience in psycho psychological and psychiatric counseling. It takes a lot of thought and time, and sometimes an almost impossible amount of patience to actually get the truth out of the person in trouble. The truth is loaded with so much irrelevant material. It is surrounded by so many excuses that it sometimes takes a number of conferences to even make a dent in the defense mechanisms which the person has built for himself. It all ended up, he's at the uh, psychiatrist or psychologist for treatment because his life has fallen apart. But even if he gradually admits that he had something to do with it, which he may under pressure, if you can keep at it long enough, he does not learn not to do it again. A, li a little different situation arises. His experience does not directly cover it, and he goes into another cycle of trouble. All this begins by failure to culture the mind in the first place. The individual who in work is careful to avoid responsibility, who is lazy, who is interested more in doing as he wants to than as he should, to whom every job is simply a menace. These people gradually destroy their own mental lives and their own emotional backgrounds. And if they don't do it, some of their friends or relatives help them to get into these troubles. Now, one of the most common examples of this type of thing is alcoholism. Every alcoholic has had experiences that should have cured him. But his mind was not strong enough to give him the willpower to correct his own weakness. Now, the, re the reason he has a mind is to discover the weakness and to support the correction of it. And where the individual keeps on making mistakes, he is ignoring the mind. And he is ignoring it because he has never given it authority or disciplined it or made it a useful part of his mechanisms. He has simply done as he pleased until the mind finally stopped chiding him and just gave up in despair. So this type of thing is something we all have to face as time goes on. Now, the effect of the, of the mental uh, forgetfulness on a religious level is very interesting. It will cause an individual to completely overlook uh, a situation involving a conviction or belief about life. An individual joins a church or joins an organization, and he takes upon himself the obligations to keep the rules of that organization. We will say that perhaps in a small town he's gone out and received a riverside baptism. He has been born again. He has accepted the gospel. He has been given a New Testament to read, and he is reading it. He is trying his best. But uh, I attended a meeting of uh, evangelists and ministers some years ago, and uh, they told me of the thousands of people they had converted at these riverside baptisms, small church baptisms, or whatever the facilities were at the time. And they admitted, under pressure, that 90% of the converts had to be reconverted at least once a year. <laughs> it wouldn't hold. Now, assuming that a spiritual dedication to the service of God and truth is about as powerful a self uh, dedication or a self uh, enrollment in a faith that it's possible to imagine. In the presence of God in prayer, surrounded by believers, 
who are doing everything they can to inspire this penitent to improve his life, and with his own promise, his most sacred promise, that he isn't going to make these mistakes anymore. In six or eight months, he's right back where he was before. The alcoholic is drinking again. Uh, the immoral person is back in his habits. The shaky home is back shaky again because the old miseries and troubles come back. Why? Because actually the individual has not given discipline to his own life. If he had even done such a common everyday discipline as going to work every day to earn his living, he would have had a little strength. But of course, if he did have to work, he objected to that, resented it, and could only dream of the time when no one could tell him what to do. So all this situation uh, led to a, a failure as far as trying to get the individual's inner resources to work to help him. Now, as we grow older, as we say, some of these experiences begin to get a little weaker. And nature has one habit that is rather interesting. It weeds out those occurrences uh, which most deeply uh, impressed us. These it holds on to. The others gradually fade away. Now the fact that we retain that which most impresses us does not mean that we will retain only that which is most useful to us. Almost anything can be among those points that are remembered. Some of them are very bad. Some of them are merely statements of delinquency and the consequences thereof. But they were positive, remembered factors in our experienced life. Often these factors are not very fortunate. Very often they are mis tragics, tragedies, or sorrows, or misfortunes. But if we thought for a moment, we'd realize that nature has weeded out those things which could have been of great value if we, had mis if we had understood them. And also that they are still being brought back to us for consideration because maybe in a whole lifetime there were 20 occurrences that were remembered to the end. And these are the ones that had the big message. And really all of them involve suffering. The individual finds gradually that he is being reminded of the failures in himself and these failures in himself uh, come back to haunt him when other things are no longer remembered but their own children as they come along childhood memories are very often uh, remembrances of mysteries things happening that affected but the child never knew why or how or what was happening. The uh, young person was told to do things that he did without understanding. When he was in trouble, he wasn't instructed. When he needed information, he didn't get it. And all these things gradually resulted either in despondency or rebellion. So we have children that sink into themselves because they do not understand life and there is no one to talk to who really wants to help. Then there are those who are catered to until they're spoiled. All of these different conditions will show lack of judgment, and in the small child, the judgment rests with the parents. And if the parents neglect the child, the adult, from when that child grows up to maturity, is deficient in moral and ethical values. And this goes on and on and on. Now, what happens? That's what, what is all this memory business about, anyway? We are going to lie down one of these days and uh, rest, as they said, with our fathers. What happens to these things? Does memory die with us? Is it something that is only a record of what we fail to do in this embodiment? Is the memory that we take forward only a summary of our own mistakes? Or is there something more to it? Did some previous memory bring us into our present condition? And some subsequent condition is going to be affected by our present memory. As far as the universe is concerned, 
What difference does it make whether we remember or not? Actually, our own small lives cannot be regarded as being of sufficient importance to cause the universe to be stirred by our personal delinquencies. So what does it all add up to? Well, Buddha and some of the older teachers, in fact, some today are thinking in the same way, that this memory factor is, a, is part of our entire cosmic lesson. It is part of the reason for ourselves, for this memory is of vital importance to ourselves. And because of this vital memory's importance, it isn't necessary for our lives to be overshadowed by some outside factor. It is overshadowed, perhaps, by the memories which are locked within our own eternal natures. The brain goes. The mind is gradually absorbed into the higher vehicles of life and is once more identified with universal mind. But the thoughts that we think do not die. Something happens to them. The way of life that we have lived now bears witness to something that once was. If we come into this world with a dream, it's because we went out of the world before with a dream. If we come in with a nightmare, it is because we brought a nightmare with us. And what was the nightmare? It was the carelessness, thoughtlessness, selfishness of previous embodiments uncorrected. There is no solution to the problem of the, humanity, of the human being except personal reformation. The activation of those powers within the self by means of which we can bring life into pattern and order. Everyone has a certain amount of memory, a certain amount of experience knowledge. In some cases it is comparatively slight. In other cases it is more highly advanced. But in everyone there is something that can contribute to the rectification of character. So we come in to the present embodiment without any conscious realization of what we were before. But today, while we are here, from day to day, we gradually lose realization of the earlier years of our own lives. The weakness of our own minds results in a kind of forgetfulness. We forget what we have never learned, but we remember that which is most deeply etched upon memory. That's the reason why uh, nearly all of our arts are more highly developed than any other branch of learning. This is because arts were with us from very ancient times. We had arts before we had languages, that is, written languages. We had arts long before we had sciences. Therefore, the musician has to practice every day. The painter has to learn the rules of his art and keep those rules. The uh, musician, the singer, has to practice every day or loses control of the voice. So if a child is born with one of these aptitudes, it's because he has disciplined himself. Now this doesn't mean he has disciplined every phase of his nature, but he has disciplined something. And that which he brings forward is the asset resulting from personal discipline. Now, once discipline is attained, it can be diversified. It may be that the individual learned in the past to play a violin and gave maybe 50, 60 years to constant practice toward the perfection of that skill. This ability may come down into the present embodiment, but there is also a skill of decision and dedication which may enable this person to diversify into some other field but have the discipline to carry on. So anyone who has no aptitude has not disciplined his own mind. He hasn't done the work that was necessary to create a pattern of self-control by means of which without effort on his own part the mind does its work well. 
It takes care of the problems that come along. It thinks common sense and also reminds the person constantly of his own responsibility for personal conduct. Now, if through the li life we're living now, we do add something to the dis dis discipline, perhaps we add a new focus to it, perhaps we decide to do something else, but we still make a decision. Today, a great many decisions are being made in science, probably more than ever before. And uh, the reason is that the persons who go into science are persons who have a long background of mental disciplines. Now, when they came into the world, they had no knowledge of these disciplines. But inside themselves, they had a kind of dedication. They had a sense of searching for significance. They wanted to do something, and when they found out what it was, they went into it heart and soul because they had already learned to go into things with heart and soul. So in the sciences, there's progress is rapid because the matter is of significance to the individual. It is something that survives the shifting of time. Now, there are things that we can learn in one embodiment which are no longer any value to us in the future. Then all that we have is the discipline we have laid or gained, but we must find new outlets for it. But always, if we have disciplined the mind at some time, some way, it is available as a pattern of integrities when we need strength of character. So if we don't get too far, even in this life, presuming that we don't fulfill all the dreams that we have, if we go out of this world better disciplined than we were before, the life is a success. And the proof of this better discipline is the fact that we are able to lead our own characters more effectively and with greater integrity. So little by little, the things that do not count drop away. It may well be that in some previous embodiment we made chariots, but they're not making them anymore, and there's no use making chariots. But if we've learned to make chariots, we can learn to do other things. We find that we can control skill that we can make our hands and minds do the things we want them to do. We have what we call abilities, or aptitudes. And today young people all over the world are running around trying to find out what their aptitudes are, and some of them never find out because they haven't had any yet. <laughs> but they're going to stay on working at it. They're going to find themselves frustrated. They're going to find themselves at the bottom of a heap instead of at the top until finally they gain enough character to revolt against their own lack of discipline. So discipline is probably the greatest secret in the world. And discipline, united with dedication, is probably the highest form of life that we can attain. But discipline, um, tied into other less desirable facts or the processes, uh, with delinquencies and things of this nature can be a very terrible penalty upon us. Now at the end of each life this mind thing seems to retire. And in the way of retiring it seems to go gradually something like uh, the development and collapse of a universe. Little by little the material and matters and substances of life uh, the mental life of the individual gradually fade out they go into a dark hole of unknown and unknowing. We do not know where they came from, but we know that gradually, in the end of things, there is a gradual decline of individuality, and things move into the great dark unknown. Now, the great dark unknown is not really dark, and it is not a formidable or dangerous thing. For most persons, the unknown is nothing but truth. Most people just don't know about it. The unknown is strange because we haven't experienced it. We are afraid of it because we do not understand it. We do not dare to trust ourselves upon it because for us it might be merely a, some kind of a vacuum. But actually, when we get to the end of all of these conditioned existences through which we pass, we are gradually coming to the final reason for ourselves. We are not going on to infinity with skills in 
bookkeeping or in skills in uh, industry or as bankers and lawyers and doctors. These are aspects of skills that are gained through discipline. But the great discipline itself, per se, apart from any object of discipline, means final the overcoming of all limitation, all negation, all inattitude, inaptitude, all ignorance within the self. And when the disciplines all are complete, when the individual is no more to learn here by any of the means available to him, or has gained a point where the values of life have become clearly sketched for his consciousness, he then finds himself on the edge of the mystery of his own survival because uh, the nature does not demand that the individual repeat himself. He doesn't have to go through time after time lessons that he has already learned. He goes to take the lessons that he has not learned. And when there are no longer lessons that he has not learned, then his participation in a mortal sphere devoted to lessons is no longer re relevant. The person fades out of the imperfect by transcending it. As long as there is no conflict between inner consciousness and the realities of nature, the individual is not subject to natural infirmities. He is only subject to the mistakes that he makes. And when he stops making them, he is no longer subject to their consequences. This is, in a sense, the answer to the Indian concept of karma. There are some that feel that karma goes on forever, and that you are paying for your own sins countless times, and that you are making the same mistake countless times, and this goes on forever. No legitimate system of philosophy has ever taught that, or believed it, or wanted anyone else to believe it. The reason why the individual is under karma is because he has failed various lessons along the way. His failure is usually through ignorance, because ignorance itself is the weakening factor. The ignorant person has not the courage to live well. This is one of the important areas of thought. He is, he is weak because he is ignorant. He is ignorant because he is weak. And in the compound of these factors, he continues to make the mistakes by which he is subjected to karma. But when this type of uh, duty is at an end, he is no longer subject to karma. In the Mahayana system of Buddhism, as taught in China, Japan, and uh, most parts of Asia, uh, the individual who finally attains the complete release from the cycle of mistakes had gradually impersonalized himself. The uh, Bodhisattva, or the uh, highest uh, attainment of man as an individual, the human being as an individual, is one in whom all of the mistakes of life have ceased. They have ceased because he will not set the causes in motion that bring them. He will not allow any imperfection to remain uncorrected in his own nature. He is not being saved by anybody but himself, even as he cannot be lost except by his own mistakes, and even those will ultimately be corrected. The Bodhisattva or the perfectly enlightened soul achieves the edge of eternity. Nothing more to be learned here. What lies beyond here is the question that still goes on and for which there is no immediate answer. But according to the Buddhist, Northern Buddhist concept, the perfected soul stands, so to say, on the rim of existence. He stands in the presence of of the great silence, the great darkness, the great mystery, the mysterious thing that to all creation appears to be a vacuum. He is therefore in the presence of an unconditioned. He has deserved liberation because he has perfected 
all of the vehicles with which he has been endowed. He has gone through hundreds of incarnations and become a truly enlightened being. And he has a choice to make. He can either go on into this unknown, this hole or darkness, the dark hole in which there is no memory, there is nothing. Or else he can pause and say to himself, if I go on, the entire cycle of material or mortal conditions through which I have passed ends. I am no longer even aware of the past. I am not aware of anything that I have previously known. I have no sense of knowledge within myself. Knowledge has gone to sleep with ignorance. The whole thing is finished. But I still exist. I have a strange existence which enables me to say that I exist. An, a senseness of reality. Now if I step through into that dark hole, will that die also? Will that be then the complete extermination of a being? And the powers that be haven't given him a very good answer to that because they expect him to make up his own mind. But the answer seems to be that what he calls the dark hole or the inevitable, the universal, the infinite, the unconditioned, the primordial, that which was before beginnings, that is actually the beginning of something else. The, the uh, being does not cease, but goes into an entirely different dimension of existence. An existence in which the lessons that it has learned here prepares it for that unknown future, which is infinitely beyond anything that we know here. The reason why he has to be perfected before he can go there is because that which is there demands a higher degree of attainment than any individual can completely accomplish uh, in this world. So the being stands there on the border of existence. And then according to the Buddhist Mahayana doctrine, there is a pause. Because the last emotion that the individual has, when everything else has gone and ceased, when all ambitions have died, when all dreams have fulfilled themselves or faded away, what is the last single thread that holds the human consciousness to existence. And uh, in Buddhism, that single thread is love. And that love has as its major expression compassion. The um, Maitreya Buddha, the Buddha to come, or the Buddhist state in man to come, is called compassion infinite tenderness toward all that lives. So the being standing on the gate of eternity, or at the gate, has a choice, the last choice it can make. It can either go on into that infinite which it has earned, and of which it as yet is not able to find a definition. Or it can turn back and become a servant, a server, of human beings who have not yet attained. And in the northern system of Buddhism, those who turn back are the bodhisattvas, the great servers, the ones who have given up their own eternity in order to make certain, as the Konnan Rotsatsu taught, that when it finally goes into this infinite eternal, it will take with it every creature that exists in the world. It cannot and will not go till with it all living things can come to the same end. So in Buddhism there is this strange concept of this hole in the dark. The darkness of the unknown, the ultimate unknown. Some religions try to fulfill this mystery in the concept of identity with God. Well, this probably is it. But the identity with God is not what we think of it as identity with God. 
It is not some kind of a paradisical state. It is not a state in which there is no longer labor. It is not a state of finish, finally. It is a state of a transcendent destiny beyond what we know. It is something that means that the particles of individuality have faded away, have disappeared, have been drawn into the mysterious vacuum of eternity, but they still exist. And beyond this, there is still other realms that must be reached. That life is eternal, growth is eternal, and ultimately, uh, the state of the human being is unknowable as far as its ultimate condition is concerned. But we know that it's going to be transcendently in, in, unknowable. It will be infinite in its unknowing, but it will be perfect. Perfection lies somewhere at the other end of a great tube or channel that leads through all the kingdoms of nature. It is a constant disappearing from a condition to reappear in a higher condition. It is going to sleep in this world to awaken in a world of reality. And to accomplish this, the path has been given. Now the path is always the same, and yet it has many names also. Discipline is the main name, but discipline is also humility. It is detachment from all known vice or excess. It is infinite tenderness toward all that lives. It is a desire to sacrifice self for that which is less than self. It is the certainty that we must take with us the realization that each enlightened being becomes the parent of millions and must lead them to the same perfection. It makes the enlightened person not free, but completely involved. It be not free from responsibility, but the head of a family and responsibilities increasing every day. But it is a responsibility in harmony with divine law. It is responsibility such as we think of the responsibility of Christ or the responsibility of God for creation. All things are responsible according to what they know. And the growth is knowing more and gaining more responsibility. In the esoteric teachings of the ages, there is not the, so, no such a thing as laziness. There is no such a thing as the individual free forever from the responsibilities of life. There is only increasing responsibility and the fulfillment of the inner self in selfless service to all that lives. So this way goes through the mind and the brain and the heart. And the intellectual way of going is through gaining the knowledge primarily to help us to serve others. The doctor becomes a physician in order to serve the sick. The teacher becomes a leader in schools because of the desire to teach the ignorant. Uh, the parent becomes a parent in order to protect offspring. All leaders that are fit to be leaders carry the responsibility for those they lead. In none of these is there a kind of temporal satisfaction. There is no pride in leadership. There is humility. There is no desire to climb up on other people, but rather to lift up other people to each a higher destiny. There is nothing to be done by selfishness, no vainglory, no pride of opinion, no honor in wealth. All these things are experiences of the mind that must be carried must be solved, must be outgrown, but in the meantime must be used every day for the benefit of all that lives. Thus, all the solutions that we seek can come only when the individual overcomes the instinct to the ego, the instinct to be greater than somebody else, because truly 
the one that would be the greatest among us must be the servant of all. And all growth, minds becoming stronger and more brilliant, artists painting better, philosophers thinking clearer, all of these things are part of a growth in which all work together. The great with the less great, the greater with the more great. All working toward the completion of the great purpose, the perfection of all that lives. And we all have the chance of having some part in this story, some participation in this great pattern of things. And we do it, first of all, uh, by getting rid of the impairments, the inhibitions that make us unable to grow. One, of course, is unkindness. Another is pride. Another is unwillingness to forgive an enemy. Still another is ambition to outstrip someone else. And, of course, one of the commonest ones today is the profit system. The desire always for wealth. For what? In order that we can have greater luxury. That we can be more affluent than our neighbors. But all this goes into the dark hole and never comes out. There is no solution here. Humility, simplicity, dignity. World sharing. Doing for others. Finding common ground for the peace of nations. Only through kindness and unselfishness can leaders bring their people to security. And only a world devoted to common service can prevent the constant danger of warfare and crime. Oh, no more revenge, no more cruelty, but a determination to make friends wherever possible. And where we cannot achieve friendship, never work for the opposite, but give a blessing and hope well for all concerned. Never continue any evil thoughts or any destructive habits that are apt to interfere with the mind becoming a faithful servant. After all, the power of the mind, ultimately, is to become a kind of Plato or a kind of Socrates or anything that has great solutions to the daily problems. The mind becomes the leader of the life of the individual by proving what can be done and why. But the purpose of the mind is to rectify the emotions. For no matter how much the world thinks or how much the individual thinks, unless this thought brings with it compassion, unless this thought it causes the individual to sacrifice himself for the good of others. Therefore, universal love. It is wisdom that makes love sensible. It is wisdom that makes a, a love reasonable. It takes the, the superficial emotion and makes it something that justifies our affection, that makes our love real. And a love that is not real is not love at all. But wisdom leads the way. Plato uh, is said in his older years to have said that all wisdom has but one end, that man shall build strength and sound foundation under faith. Faith is the final emotion, and faith is the acceptance of the fact that existence is something we should be grateful for that uh, uh, we should love the infinite plan and do everything we can to prove that we are willing to cooperate with it. Prayer is vo void unless this prayer is dedicated to the love and development of all that lives. So not thinking of self, but thinking always of the greater good. Memory becomes much stronger. After a while, I've talked to people who have given up most of the world's beliefs in order to have simple lives of service. And I've said, what does memory mean to you now? How do you remember things? And they said, we don't remember anymore, really. We have no memories. We are too busy serving. There is no longer any question. 
But the thing that has made that possible is that the memory and the mind did bring the individual to a degree of discrimination in which the individual was able to know that which was next, that which was the most important, and that which was the perfect expression of faith, devotion, love, and service. So the memory finally gives us a release from itself because it comes to us as a dedication rather than an attitude. It comes to us as a full realization of the wonder and beauty of the divine purpose. So uh, we are all sort of moving towards an unknown cosmic end like little atoms floating in a sunbeam. We are going towards a great something in which all existence as we know it is absorbed returns to the root of itself, fades away, vanishes away in the infinite. But this vanishment of, the, of existence is not itself eternal. In due time these atoms will come forth again in higher pattern, in greater perfection, with more nobility of purpose. And one of these days, all going well in our own consciousness, leading us in the right direction, Someday, in the inconceivable fullness of time and eternity, we shall discover the true meaning of the infinite. We shall find ourselves one with the eternal love that has protected us all the way and is the love in ourselves, and that this will flow forth again into the infinite, and upon this foundation will be built a creation that will never fail. For once we have created correctly, we have achieved eternity. This is the doctrine of the alchemist. Immortal life is the result of the individual removing from his character all imperfections, all conflicts, all uh, dissensions, not by weakness, not by, uh, by agreeing with that which is not true, but by a complete dedication in which there is no longer temptation to make a mistake because there is nothing the individual wants any longer except that truth which can never be a mistake. And so in that sense, we are floating in the mysterious beams of life and like tiny atoms floating in a sunbeam. We are part of this great plan and we are all moving uh, toward unity once more with the infinite source of all that lives. Well, I guess that's it for this morning, folks.